we did, there was a group of 15 of us gathered and collated all of the ideas from resolutions, roundtable events, and the, and the EYP health pool, and came up with a set of policy recommendations. And what underpinned all four pillars of that policy recommendation um, was a desire for greater coordination and accountable action at an international level. Then there is this issue of cross-border exchange of preparedness and also having communication in place how, uh, when measures are taken, how this is uh, communicated cross-border so that people are not trapped on each side of the border. First pillar, um, which was under health governance, um, we called for a stronger role for the World Health Organization, and we called for the EU to advocate for that as a, at, a, at a global level. And we also identified in this pillar a need for greater public trust in health information and to improve um, medical and scientific communication. If we want to move forward, we need to move forward together, and we need citizens and people to own and want to be able to make this effort to renew. What we are seeing right now, uh, compared to last year, where everybody was really scared and following all the measures, now they are fed up with it. Because along the way, they have not been uh, properly engaged in uh, why it is still necessary. Um, in the end, the successful control of such a pandemic is only done uh, with the contribution of everybody. The resilience of healthcare systems um, and how we can make sure that they have uh, greater room to flex their capacity and flex upwards in the face of um, uh, public health threats. There were certain areas that really um, uh, have to be tackled now. One is, of course, as I mentioned, the hospital preparedness, and that goes for search capacity, that goes for, for stockpiling, uh, and search capacity in terms of beds, but also additional staff, which will require some investment of training a pool that can then readily step in. Um, and the stockpiles is for the, the drugs, the equipment. So then the second pillar was um, about access on infectious diseases. And I think our headline thing here was that we called for equitable access to COVID-19 vaccine and for it to be treated as a global public uh, good. And then we also touched in this pillar on antimicrobial resistance and um, advocating for a one health approach as probably the missing, the missing key uh, so far in order to achieve that. We have also seen and uh, that health in all policies, a concept that is there since uh, a decade or more, but it's only in pa on paper. Now we have seen how health goes into all parts of society. And I think that should that experience should remain with us, uh, that uh, uh, health is such an um, important um, uh, foundation for, 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 for a happy life um, and a successful life. Um, and a, a good organization in the society that uh, all um, costs that it takes to maintain the health are an investment and not just seen as a cost. And that entails also uh, pandemic preparedness um, that we might not have to need next year, but maybe in 10 years, but then we, we will need it again. And that I think we need to keep in mind. Um, the third health end was about health innovations, and we were kind of looking at how uh, e-health solutions um, can be developed and um, can work alongside traditional care delivery in the future. We have seen that our health services have started to transform themselves to get more into the digital era. I think that the pandemic has shown us that um, digital technologies can play a huge role. They have played a huge role in at least allowing some kind of education to continue going forward, work to continue taking place, as well as also uh, new forms of social interaction so that people at least are not totally isolated. Um, the final pillar then was uh, on mental health. Um, so number one on tackling stigma around mental health. 
and um, number two investing in more preventative measures and that also ties into this idea of healthcare and all policies and um, we also identified the need for more research and as we come out of the pandemic acknowledging that young people have been hit hardest by the mental health impacts of COVID arguably. Of course you will tell me yourselves that young people are emerging as some of the biggest victims um, we see that youth is being pushed out of the labour market, that youth is being locked out of learning. So, unfortunately, when we're um, uh, working with mental health, the review of the evidence is showing us that young people report the lowest levels of well-being. At this point in time, it's very difficult to actually predict what the future is going to bring. What we do know is that the future is not going to be about getting back to normal, but about going forward to a new and hopefully in some ways better normal too. I think young people have to drive the recovery. I think young people have to be involved very much also in a discussion on these recovery plans. It's very likely, a uh, high likelihood that you will see another pandemic. I, I, uh, without a crystal ball, I can say this. So I think it's very important that uh, what is now put in place um, uh, will help you also to, to, to fare better next time. Yeah, I think that is something um, uh, that we all um, uh, neglected. How to communicate to children uh, this situation, uh, who of course also were affected. I think that is something um, that has to be thought through, uh, that it's not only um, communication to the healthcare workers, uh, then maybe to the general public, but also how does a, a teacher or a parent explain to the children how what is happening and 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 why they can't now go to the day daycare or see their friends next door for my children three or four years is a huge amount of time mm -hmm. and i'm so worried about the fact that this is something that they are going to to live with um with some kind of permanent scar. As I said, as WHO, we have set up this advisory group and working very closely with uh, ECDC with a lot of uh, brilliant input to try to see how we can really make sure that children get their lives back. Can I just say that this is probably one of the most complex issues. One of the things that is going to emerge as we go forward is that people are actually going to be looking very much for um, new leaders. And I think this is a time also for young leaders to step forward. I uh, firmly believe that this uh, central procurement has helped that uh, smaller member states, where we have quite a number in the in the EU, have access to vaccines now at a reasonable price. The fact that now every country and every country could start with the vaccination at the same time, um, uh, that is only, was only possible with the central procurement. Coming from a smaller country myself, um, I think that the EU, in spite of all the difficulties, because they were doing something so large for the first time, and of course, the only people who don't make mistakes are the people who don't try anything new at all. Anything new that is tried comes with a level of risk, and therefore it could be that things can be done better next time. But I would definitely say that what the EU managed to do is achieve internal solidarity in its borders so that those countries that were poorer or smaller did not get left behind. That we can really make sure that as a European region, since viruses do not respect borders, we can make sure that also our neighbouring countries um, beyond the European Union itself have access also to the vaccines that they need.